Hello, welcome to the Black and Blue Collar Reader. My name is Dan. Today I'm going to be reviewing R. Scott Baker's The Great Ordeal. And before I go any further, I need to warn you, this review is going to be black seated, splashed with spoilers. So you have been warned. And before I go on, I'm throwing a quick shout out to Quint Van Cannon. He provided me with all that art you saw in my intro. Met up with this guy on a Facebook group called R. Scott Baker's Second Apocalypse. Go check that group out. A lot of great characters in that group. Always so accommodating, willing to help you out if you miss something. Because, hey, this is R. Scott Baker. Chances are you probably missed something. And if you didn't miss something, man, something's wrong with you, not me. But anyway, let's get right into this. We pick up in the prologue, Mathanet's dead, Esmanet is stepping up into her role as the empress, and she's running around the castle looking for her little baby boy, Calmomus. And where does she find Calmomus? Curled up on the throne, caked from head to piggy toes in blood and guts. What a cool little foreshadowing thing they drop on you in the prologue. That was really cool. However, Kelmo was in the second seat and not Kellis' seat. That I thought it thought it would have been more intriguing if he was in Kellis' seat rather than his mother's seat. But hey, the dude's a mama's boy. So what are you going to expect? So listen, we pick up. Oh, I want to go into this. So if you were to judge a book by the first sentence in the first chapter, this is what you would get in this book. The first sentence goes like this. The living should not haunt the dead. Ooh, that's a five-star line right there. Anyway, we pick up in the great ordeal. And if you remember from the White Luck Warrior You'll remember what's on the menu. Oh, 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 that reminds me. Yo, I I hit 100 subscribers, and somebody is actually being a, is sponsoring this video right here. So hey, stick around for this commercial. Let me introduce my sponsor. This video is sponsored by Emerald Lagasse's The Great Horse Duver. Oh, pff, I'm an idiot. Sorry. This video is sponsored by Emerald Lagasse's The Great Hors d'Oeuvre. Good evening, madam, sir. Welcome to Emerald Lagasse's The Great Hors d'Oeuvre. May I start you off with an entree? Yes, thank you very much. And, uh, you know... I was going through this menu here, and you know, I just don't see anything at all. Like, I thought I would, you know, there'd be at least some braised lamb or something like that. Do you have any specials? Yes, our special this evening is imported straight from Golgotharoth. Seasoned and seared shrunk medallions topped with blueberries and scallions dubbed from the seashore. Shrunk meat? Hey, babe, you ever tried shrunk meat? No? So what's that, like soul food? In a matter of speaking. Woo! I don't know if I'll be eating there anytime soon. Anyway, we're on the great ordeal. They're consuming their enemy and they're slowly becoming shrunk. Their night vision is getting better. They're salivating when they fight. They are also getting Hannibal Lecter type hard ons when they fight these shrunk. It is just getting wild on the ordeal. But I want to talk about the sons of Sepalor, man. They push into the horde and they enter this land of Raelith. And there's something about this land. It's seeping with ancient evil and it changes them. And when they come out like shrunk or like scared of Sibyl and the sons of Sepalor, it's like he actually 
walk through hell just by stepping foot on this diseased ground. It's so cool. We get to follow these guys all the way through the end of this book, and they are some bad dudes. I also like how Esmanette takes a step up. She steps into her position in this, and um, uh, Felipe or the the Lopa, whatever her name is, the other, the girl, uh, Anna Sarimbor, she's like trying to talk her mom into stepping into this role. Also, you know, Esmanette's general is like, yo, you got to show these people who you are. And I love this part right here where she steps up. I'm going to read a, a little bit of this part. We go to 105 real quick. And... Uh, the pariah is outside of the walls of Momin, threatening to attack, and he uh, sends a uh, parlay to meet up with the Empress Esmanette, and they had this little dialogue in front of everybody. I'm going to read it real quick, and, you know, the, uh, the pariah is being a dick, and he's like, you know, you must forgive my men. We found him, let women rule our hearts and our beds. You sound ridiculous to them. Esmanette could feel her entourage clinch in embarrassment and outrage around her. But she was too old a whore to be rattled by this kind of contempt and derision. Her shame, after all, was at once their shame. Where wives were left guessing, whores knew. The harder the laughter, the more pathetic the weeping. Esmanet says, what is it, Fane says? Cursed are those who mock their mother. Faniel says, you are no mother to me. Esmanet says, and you act like my son nonetheless. She called down in inspiration, a son bearing grievances. Ooh, she sunned him, bro. She dropped the mic. He did not like that. I'm like... How she stepped up in front of everybody was like, yo, I might be a woman, but you ain't pushing me around, dude. Uh, that was awesome. And, of course, the whole battle, uh, it turns out that Faniel was actually Nepa, and he tries to kill Esmanet and gets lit up with arrows and essentially dies by trying to attack her. And once Meppa was taken out, uh, Fanyol and the Fanin were out of luck because nobody could breach the walls of moment without a badass sorcerer. So that was just a cool part. Yeah! Sword wheel! Hey, quit choking your brother! Bro, don't make me come over there and separate you two. Yeah, we're we gonna have a circumcision up in here. Yay. Yeah. Should be ashamed of yourself. Anyway, speaking of shame, right? We had this part. One can hold anguish in their teeth, fury in their brow, and their eyes. But shame occupies us whole, fills our shrinking skin, weakening even as it awakens. Oh, such a cool line. We pick up with sore wheel and we get to see that Yachmer's, you know, mask that they put on Swirwheel. It actually is confirmed that the Anasarimbors cannot see his face or read his face because Moengus is like, yo, he hates you. And Swirwheel's like, no, all I see is love in his face. And that is going to cause problems with the Unam that they are trying to go to the non-men and, and, you know, uh, go through this agreement that they've had that they have to bring one of their enemies. However, to see it in Sorreal's face, he does not look like an enemy because all his face is portraying is love rather than hate. So when they get to uh, Isturbent, the non men see that this guy loves the Anister Rimbors. He doesn't hate them because of the mess that Yatwar has placed on his face. And all of a sudden, you know, the non men get pissed and they yoke them all up and take them captive because Sorwheel is in love with the Anna Sarimbors, but that is only the case because of the mask that Yatwar has placed on him. I thought that was a really cool part right there. I also like how we get to see the White Luck Warrior. We get in his head and it's kind of like this 
metaphysical multiverse string theory type thing where he's seeing all these different avenues. It, it, it kind of came to me like the logos was playing out in his mind. I like seeing the white luck warrior, um, you know, his thoughts and, and the actions that may be coming. I thought that was really cool in this book. You know, one person that took a huge step up for me was Mamara. Mamara, we get to see more into the judging eye. I love that. We also, you know, we pick up with her in Ishawal, and she goes into Ishawal, and they get to this this place, I think it's called the mothering where they see like these huge bones. And apparently those bones were the women that were birthing these Dunyane and her eye opens and she sees how evil the Dunyane were. However, when they showed up at Ishwal, that place was destroyed. And Akka thought that Kellis got there first and destroyed everybody, but no, it was the consult that showed up also. The non-men showed up and they freaking just unloaded on all these Dunyane and essentially killed them all except for two. Two of actually Kellis's relatives. We get what the guy called the survivor. He comes out, his face is just a mask of cuts and scars and a little boy with freaking crab hands. You know, interbreeding doesn't really work too well. So yeah, he's deformed. But I was so interested in this survivor because, yeah, you know, we get to dive back in to a Doom Yane's head. And it was so cool to get into that head. But, you know, uh, Mamar's eye opens and she breaks this dude down. For some reason, you know, we get his story and, you know, he came out of the uh, of Ishawal after the, the destruction. And we get this part where he collects... Uh, 100 stones and kills 99 birds. And it was so interesting. I guess it just kept this stone. But we get to this part where he's trying to, the stranger's trying to convince Mamara and Akka to trust him. And Mamara's like, nah, I can't trust you. Like, I've seen you with the eye. And he keeps asking her to look at him again. And he looks and she looks at him again. And, and you know, She's not saying anything, but he's reading her face. I love this part on 390. If I can get to it real quick, it was so cool. 390. Look into my face. Can you see it? Reflected in my eyes. Can you see it? Your damnation. And Aka says to the stranger, she says you gather 100 stones. I thought that was so cool. Cuts, cuts, and cuts. She says you only think you survived the thousand, thousand halls. The survivor blinked, fell back in a way, dissolving into fractional multitudes. He had always been pieces, glimpsing pieces, splinters of what would happen. Each a living claim yearning to be raised up from the multitudes and to exult in the flesh of the real. He, his grin is both easy and sad, the smile of one who understands the errors of the heart too well not to forgive the hatred of another. Aga says to him, she says that you have just decided to murder her. That part was so cool. And she ends up breaking him down. And then, like, she just wrecks his whole world and is just like, hey, you know, hit some carry. And he snorts this carry, and then this is what happens, right? Like I said, she just basically broke him down and told him that he's basically supposed to die. That is his his destination, his death. And here's this part, right? The little boy asks the stranger, what is it? The stranger says, things, he murmurs to the panorama, are simple. The kid asks, the Madden worsens? He looks back to the boy. Yes. He draws the hundredth stone from the waist of his tunic. This is yours now. The boy, 
the most blessed fraction, looks to him in alarm. He would deny the interval between them if he could. He cannot. The survivor stands, begins sprinting. He marvels at the magic that joins will to reflexing limbs, to flexing limbs. A cry spoken in a tongue that even animals know. The survivor does not so much as move as the ground runs out. But the leap, yes, that is his. That is his. As is the yawning plummet, the drop into the most empty of arms. She broke him down, gave him some curry. Dude gave his last stone to the boy and straight and ran off the mountain and plummeted to his death. And I was a little disappointed because I really liked the survivor. I wanted to, him to have a huge role in the next coming books, but he was like, nah, I'm out. I can't handle this. And he just takes his own life, dives off the mountain. That was just absolute craziness. All right. And of course, you know, we got to get into this part, right? Kellis and Proyas, chapter four. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you the cliff notes of this chapter and kind of like uh, relive it here. Don't worry, don't run off. This will be PG thirteen, okay? But yo, in chapter four, we get into the dialogue of Callus and Proyas, <laughs> and Callus is like this to Proyas, like, "Well, listen, my man, I'm uh, I'm not all there, man. Like, <laughs> I ain't your prophet, man. I'm I'm kind of crazy. I'm a few shirts short of a barbecue, bro. Yeah, <laughs> I am not sane." And Kellis is like, what? Are you kidding me? I thought you were, you know, our savior, our prophet. I I've, I've de demolished lands and empires for you. I've killed men, women, and children. And Kellis is like, nah, I'm crazy, man. Sorry about that. But, yo, Akka was really your, your prophet. You should have followed him, bro. But, you know, sorry about that. Hey, turn around. There's a head on a pole behind you. And as soon as freaking Proyce turns around, Oh, damn, Kellis, you wrong, bro. You just straight wrong. Brings me back to the prologue of these two names. The prologue of the judging eye with with Cal Momus playing with that beetle and like kind of playing God and, and plucking off a, a limb and the beetle spinning in circles. Like, yo, that's what Kellis was doing to Broyus. Kellis should have just handed him a rope and said, yo, the tree's over there, man. Because <laughs> he was just... Ripping this dude's whole life apart. It was unbelievable. Oof. Yeah. We had to take a little bit of break after that one, right? Chapter four was no joke. I mean, we got into, you know, God being called it and the head on the pole, whether that's the outside or, or, or I don't know what that head on the pole thing is that cause, effect, consequences? Is the place called Kellis like a religious institution? I don't know, but that that chapter just bent my brain. Let me get into some of the negatives, right? Because I felt there were some negatives in this. And listen, when you got into the, the judging eye and, and we saw that Kellis had children, I was enthralled. I was like, Oh, yeah, we get some freaking twisted offspring to this guy. But in this one, sorry, in this one, man, the kids fell short. I got to say, with Cal Momus, you know, I'm like, dude, is he going to kill somebody? Like, come on, I, I, need, I, need to, I need him to get savage on somebody. And at the end, you know, he's following the white luck warrior, hiding behind pillars and in the shadows, and he's creeping up on this dude. I'm like, yeah, here we go. He's going to make up for it and nothing. Nada. Cayutus, nada. Nada. Serwa. So we get Serwa and she is held captive and, and she's singing. She has some sort of necklace that she can't, you know, use her gnosis. But she's singing to these freaking torturers in their you know, dead wives' voices, and it was getting cool, and she's having, you know, um, hallucin is, hallucin is, damn, I'm all fucked up. Hallucinations of 
her father like coming to her and he's and she's like what do i do he's like yo you're my daughter show them my portion i'm like ooh all right and and then she's like but what what happens if it doesn't work and Cal's is like pray she's like for me he's like nah for everyone and then you know that that's building up right i'm like oh Sarah's going to go savage on some mothers right and Yes, they finally did take it off, but we cut. She and we don't like see, you know, exactly what she did to people. So that for me kind of fell a little flat. I thought there was an opportunity there that was slightly missed. Um, also, like the confusion in this, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, you know, obviously, you hear my voice, I'm not the smartest dude, you know, you know, at all. And I was confused. I mean, when we were going down that weeping mountain, my brain was was like, I'm the kind of person that likes to see that picture in my head. And and when you're not giving it all to me, like I'm working harder to get that picture and I'm working harder and harder. And my brain, I swear to God, the weeping mountain caused me to be sick for like three days. I'm just finally getting over it because my brain was all over the place and, and like, listen, I, I actually, I actually, you know, my inner dialogue, I actually taped my inner dialogue when we were in the Weeping Mountain. Listen to this. How deep does this mountain go? Are we there yet? Are we running? Why are we running? Are we swinging on a chain? Did you just fucking let go? What did we hit? Is this a boat? Is that water? Am I stepping on a fucking pig carcass? Sora, what the fuck are you doing? Is that guy singing? What is in the ceiling? Are those chains? Are those stone men? Are they in the boat? Get him out of the boat. Is that fucker still singing? Did that dude just bitch slap his son to death? Is that sword the last of our light? Tell the boatman to sing me a fucking song of what the fuck is going on. So as you can see, I was having a rough go of it, but, um, you know, it really picked up at the end. I mean, come on. Kella shows up, the earthquake, but the earthquake taking out Filiopa, I at first I was like, bro, if this isn't somebody doing this earthquake, I'm quitting this book. And thank God, you know, Nefari is like, yeah, I did this. This is my God rocking this earthquake and Fanyol's like nah this is the one god and she's like nah it's my god he's like nah it's my god <laughs> that whole you know fight between them two who brought this earthquake upon moment was just funny and dude Keller shows up <laughs> and he straight kills Fanyol right away but uh not a fairy bro the what what he did to her was straight moon dude it was so good Apparently, I, I don't know. I guess I can read this. Anyway, he grabs her up. He 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 grabs her by the forehead, and all of a sudden, he disappears. And then he shows back up right in front of Malawibi. And this is his dialogue. I love it. Right. So we don't know what happened to Yat. You know, the the mother. And he's like, "Do you think Yat were allowed her to see this?" Uh, the the Mumbai schoolman stood. Paralytic in a manner he had never before known what, what he stammers. Then he heard it as an eerie intrusion upon the rippling of winds. Mother! The faraway call. Nearing? Malawibi frowned, looked skyward in a panic, saw Satma Nanaferi pitching and kicking for the merest instant before her image exploded into pulp across the arch of his uh, muzu chalice. Her plummet? Oh, 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 dude. He was like, do you think Yatwer allowed her to see this? And he's like, what? Splat? Her plummet? Oh, dude. Callis just dropped it on him. That was so damn cool. And then he, he yokes uh, um Malawibi up, straight butt, decapitates him, and then puts one of his incorporeal heads on his body, and the dude actually sees him walking off. Oh, man, that part was so freaking dope. It was so good. And, of course, 
we got to get to the end, right? We got to get to the best part of this book. And listen, because it was so confusing, I was giving this book like a four. Until obviously this part, Dagley Ash, that whole craziness with, with a bomb. I didn't even know it was a bomb at first. I was so messed up, you know, and sick from the Weeping Mountain that I was just, I wasn't retaining shit. But apparently it was a bomb that blew everybody up in that and the death of Soban and he's seeing his boy like on the ground getting freaking, you know, oh, that part was freaking crazy. And he sees him in his other life and he's just like, he's reaching out to himself. Don't trust. Oh, so good. Those parts were quite well done. A lot of confusion there, I have to say. But once I kind of relived the book and went through everything for this uh, review, you know, it, it definitely started to become a little more clear. And I'm sure that this book might kick it up to a five upon reread because I, I don't know. I, I don't know whether I was in the mood for this one, but yo, the best part. At the end, you know, Mamara, Aka, and the little Dunyane boy are running, and they hear, you know, shrunk out in the wilderness, and they hide, and all of a sudden they see a dude coming out on a horse with a bunch of schwazens on. And I'm like, oh, oh, are you kidding me? Because I had no idea. I didn't read the whole glossary of who's in this book or nothing. And I remember reading, you know, what comes before all these chapters. And they keep saying, my dude's dead. So I was just like, hey, I know I didn't see a body, but, you know, that's what he's telling me, right? And I was just like, is it happening? And then, no, it's, it's this dude, Blueface. I'm like, oh, and then they start that slow, like, seven or eight pages walking through the camp and I'm just every as they're walking I'm like looking left looking right oh where's he at I know he is he here please tell me he's here and then they bring him to like that the head chief I'm like oh shit he's not here and then you know they ask Aka what he's doing Aka tells him what he's doing and all of a sudden lies I'm like oh Nair, bro. Nair comes out and he just drops these lines. The dialogue between Ak and him was just phenomenal, man. It was so dope. That saved this book for me at the end. The the, the battle of uh, Dagley Ash and Nair coming out of nowhere because I didn't know. That, that was just icing, right? That pushed it up to like a 4748 for me. I got to say, I love this book. And that's where I'm ending it. I think I'm at like 30 minute fucking video here. So I'm going to draw the line and, uh, you know, give this a 4.7. You know, I can't wait to jump into the unholy console, but my brain is going to need a rest. And I'm, I'm going to have to do something a little bit easier than Baker. Cause you know, in this book, he threw it back to the Prince of Northern style where, you know, there's the confusion, there's the, the big prose uh, and the vocabulary he's throwing at you. And, and this book affected me uh, in good ways and definitely in some bad ways. But listen, I, I'm going all over the place. Like, do I want to pick Malazan back up? I got I got Malice. Should I pick that up? I also got um, a an indie book coming in the mail soon that I've already read like four chapters on Kindle from. So I'm, I'm going all over the place, but I got to say like Fletcher and beyond redemption. I love those characters and I want to get back into those characters. So I am already getting into the mirror's truth. That's probably going to be my next review. I just love these characters. I can't wait to get back in and see what's going on. I feel there's a third book coming. I don't know when it's coming out, but I can't wait for it to, to do so. So this will be my next review. Let me thank you guys if you actually stuck around for this whole video. I hope you guys got a laugh at it. I did a little acting and stuff. <laughs> that ain't my bag, but I hope you, you found it funny. Hey, let's all, like I always say, man, let's all keep... Growing to be better people. Let's all keep growing to be better readers. And I will see you guys on the flip side. Peace. Everything that happens is motivated.